just here this past week having a state sale, and Ms. O'Neill was privileged to get some of her Bible. Exodus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Now those of you who know this passage should say, Amen. Sure. At the miraculous provision and hand of God in this situation. Yeah. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. What a blessing. Not only did Mama get to see her baby stay alive, but she got paid by the government <laughs> yeah. to raise her own child. Yeah. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. We'll stop there. But would you look at verse 12? Verse 12 was not something done on the heat of the moment. I believe that Moses had thought about what he did. Verse 12 says, And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Would you pray? Dear Father, please bless the Word of God to our hearts. Lord, if there's some person here who's religious but lost, someone who's attended church this morning and yet is not one of those that can be included in the song when we all get to heaven. Oh, dear Father, may this be the day that they trust Jesus Christ before it's everlastingly too late. He who died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Father, for the folk that are saved, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them to make the right choice. And dear Father, before that they leave, may every person have deliberately chosen to believe and obey you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you be seated? If you don't see the miraculous, marvelous providence and hand of God in the Scripture reading that we just finished, you need to read it again. Moses was raised by his mother, or at least nursed by his mother, in the house of Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible says that Moses was trained. He was learned. 
in the wisdom of the Egyptians. We don't know how long that baby Moses spent with his mother. Maybe his mother uh, nursed him and was a nurse and maid uh, to Pharaoh's daughter and to him throughout his entire childhood. If so, we have no idea how many hours that she may have spent indoctrinating him in the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, telling him his background, telling him his history, telling him about the Hebrews. But the New Testament says that there came a time when Moses came to years. That is, he went past what we Baptists call the age of accountability, and he actually came to a manhood status. Now, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to take your Bibles, if you don't mind turning with me, to a companion passage in the New Testament. If you don't mind turning with me, I'd like for you to look at something here, and then I want to talk to you about what happened here. Turn in the New Testament, please, to the book of Hebrews. You'll need to go almost to the end of your Bible to get to the book of Hebrews. And I want you to find Hebrews chapter 11, where I'd like to ask you to read with me verses 24 through 27. Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter of faith, begins in verse 24 by talking about what Moses chose to do here in our scripture reading in Exodus chapter 2. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to look at verse 24. Everybody have it? If not, just listen. Hebrews 11 verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. My, my, my. What a decision to make. To be raised and to be part of the household of the king of the most powerful country at the time. But he made the choice, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I want you to notice in verse 25 the opening word of the verse. Choosing. Concerning Moses and what he did back there in Exodus, the Bible says he did that choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures for, of sin for a season. I want to title the message this morning, Making the Right Choice. Making the Right Choice. Moses, if you read Exodus chapter 2 speedily and at a glance, you might have thought that he made a hasty decision and a hasty choice. After all, the people that he chose to help didn't seem to appreciate it. As a matter of fact, when uh, word got out of what he had done, they used that to question uh, his integrity. It actually ended up leading to him being exiled from Egypt. But, as those of you who know your Bibles know that God used this for a one-third of his lifetime to shape Moses and make Moses a shepherd who would be able to lead God's people out of their bondage and captivity in Egypt. And I want you to think with me about Moses' choice. And I want you to think this morning 
about the fact that you have the opportunity to make the right choice. Life it consists to a large degree of choices that you make. Earlier I said that as we think of next Sunday being the Sunday of the weekend of our country's celebration of its birth, you and I, most of us, did not make the choice to be born in the United States of America. You just showed up here. And in showing up here, you entered into blessings because of choices that others made a long time ago. I want to talk to you about making the right choice. And the first thing I want to say about making the right choice is Moses made a deliberate choice. His choice was something that he thought about and he made a deliberate choice to do. It wasn't something, I don't believe at all, that it was something that just came across him. And Some of you know what it's like to make a bad choice and not think about it. Come on. Somebody signed a dotted line and you didn't think about the consequences. Hopefully you didn't do that for four years for the military. Yeah. Hopefully you didn't uh, sign the dotted line and, and agree to get married without thinking about it and praying about it. Yeah. Moses' choice was deliberate. I think that Moses deliberation about the choices that he made rubbed off on his assistant who actually took over in leading the children of Israel on into the promised land, Joshua. Joshua came to realize how important that it was and maybe he got some of that from being so close to the man of God named Moses. Joshua knew that it's up to the individual to choose What's right? Some of y'all remember that there came a time where Moses was going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And he appointed 12 men from the 12 tribes of Israel to go and spy out the land before they went in and took it. He did not ask those men to go and survey it and come back with a recommendation about whether or not to do it. He did not ask for that. God did not tell him to get a vote on whether or not to go into the promised land. They were supposed to go. When they came back, 10 of the 12 spies said, we can't take that place. Giants live there. Well, it's a great place. But we'll be overcome. We'll be destroyed. But there were two men who said, hey, Let's go in. We're well able to overcome them. God's on our side. Most of you people know who those two men were. Some people have even named, if they had two boys, some people even named their children after those two boys. But it's very possible and very likely that there's not a person in this auditorium today who without research in your Bible there's probably not a person here who can name even one of the ten other spies who came back and said, don't go, don't go. Nobody remembers them. But a lot of people remember Joshua and Caleb. Matter of fact, some people sing jo uh, Caleb's song, I Want That Mountain. And Joshua uh, was the person who ended up taking over the nation of Israel and bringing them into the promised land when Moses was barred from it by speaking wrongly and striking uh, the rock instead of uh, speaking to it. And you remember that he didn't get to go in, but Joshua did. And Joshua is known, you may not think of him personally, but Joshua is known for making the statement that is plastered on homes all across the world. I'm talking about when he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you remember that? 
Some of you have it on your house. But most people don't think about that entire verse. The verse says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In the first part of that verse, he said, choose, make up your mind, make the choice, choose who you're going to serve. And he said, but I'll let you know, I've already made my choice. He said, it's for me and my house. Isn't that right, Miss Joshua? Isn't that right, little Joshua Jr.? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He had made the choice. The choice of Moses was delivered. It was prepared by his upbringing. He knew both sides. I believe it was pondered in his mind and in his heart. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He pondered it. He thought about it. There would be a cost. There would be a price to pay. But this choice was part of his character. You listen to me. The choices that you make will shape your character. But more than that, the choices that you make reveal your character. Think about it. It's the truth. And the choices that you make are going to have consequences down the road. I'll have more to say about that in this message, but that choice that Moses made revealed what kind of a man that he was. You need to make the right choice this morning. Choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua said. Choose you this day whom you will serve, Brother O'Neill repeats, in preaching the Word. And in preaching the Word, I say to you people here in 2020, you need to make a choice today. You members of Glenwood, you need to make a choice today to do what is right. I mentioned something last Sunday about what a blessing it would be if we had the people who were there in attendance would all show up for visitation on Saturday and go see one household or one person. And if we were to get you to choose and you make that right choice today and show up this Saturday, it would literally have an amazing impact like our church doesn't normally have on our community. If everybody would go and see somebody for the Lord uh, this week. But it's your choice. I preached to you Wednesday night on don't neglect your daily bread. We talked about the manna that God provided how that every man is supposed to get it every day. And I liken that not only to the Lord Jesus Christ sustaining us daily, but you getting the sustenance from the written Word of God that God gives you for your fuel on a daily basis. That night I finished going through my Bible once again, reading it and completing it from cover to cover Wednesday night. I want to encourage you to make the choice to read your Bible. Hopefully, you're here this morning in church. Even though somebody may have invited you, maybe somebody uh, called you, maybe somebody uh, said they were coming and give you a ride, hopefully, you made a deliberate choice. You made a choice after you had pondered it, and you made a choice as part of your character that you were going to be in the house of God today. For now, all these years of ministry... I'm not sure about before that during the time I was in the military. But with Miss O'Neill here as my witness, the Lord has blessed me and enabled me to be in church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek service for all these nearly 45 years now. I know that's not going to be continuous. I know that as I get older, I'm going to get sick. I know eventually I'll get to where something happens. But it's not just that God was good to me in addition to God being good and gracious and powerful and helping me. I made a deliberate choice to be in church every time that the doors are open. 
I'd like to encourage you to make the right choice. When I go out of town, I go to church. I choose to do that. I choose, if I, if I can, I make up my mind to find a good church before that we leave and make plans to be there. I've gone out of the country and not missed. As a matter of fact, we were determined to find a good place to go when we went to Brazil. And through just trying to find a good place to go, I ended up preaching. We arrived there on Tuesday, I think it was. We arrived there on Tuesday. I preached Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, I think it was Saturday night, and then Sunday all day. I preached on Wednesday that night, and then I think on Friday we headed back uh, to the States. I didn't ask for those opportunities. They just came up. God blessed, I believe. Number two, I want you to think about the choice of Moses. Not only was deliberate. Hey, I want you to do what God leads you to do, but He will not make you do it. I don't want you to, to you save people. I don't want you to surrender to some ministry or some work just simply because the preacher says, somebody needs to do this. But God won't make you do it. God will stir you. He'll empower you. But somebody will have to make the choice to say, I will if God wants me to. And if God will help me, I will learn to play a musical instrument. I will sing in the choir. I will teach a Sunday school class. I will go on soul winning visitation. I will show up at the Bible Institute. I will become a tither. I will pray daily. Whatever it is in the Christian life, those are some things that come to mind as a preacher. Whatever it is, make a deliberate choice. Number two, the choice of Moses was not only deliberate, but it was daring. It was daring to do what he did. He may have seemed like a powerful man and make it easy for him to make that choice, but I want you to know, when you get up into positions of responsibility, there's more pressure on you to make the right choice than there is on other people. Some of you met Jim Lavalito. Brother Lavalito was in our church in Georgia. I trained him. And before I got done training him, the door, the door opened for him, at my recommendation, to become pastor of Fernwood Baptist Church. Not Glenwood. He ain't coming here. <laughs> Fernwood Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. That was over 30 years ago. And Brother Jim hadn't been there too long. And he made the comment to me a little later. He said, Preacher, he says, I never realized how much easier that it was for me to rest upon your choices in leading our church. Because he said, all I had to do was back you up. Because he said, I knew you were right. I did. He said, I just backed you up and said, preacher said it, let's do it. And he said, it was a whole different thing when I got to Fernwood Baptist Church. And I, I had to be led by the Lord to lead the church, uh, to follow uh, Him and, uh, and serve God. You need to pray for President Trump. You need to pray for uh, Governor DeSantis. You need to pray for Mayor uh, Curry. You need to pray for each one of your leaders. They are under pressure. Now, my friend, you need to be willing to step out by faith. First time you decide and make the choice, I won't be a tither. I want you to know that's a daring move to decide that that's what God said in His Word. You're going to do it. Now, for some of us who have tithed for many years, we're used to it. Yeah. We've seen God bless and take care of us so much that we wouldn't think of robbing God as it's described in Malachi chapter 3. Amen. But but for somebody who's not done it, it's a daring thing. That's right. For somebody who's never gone so winning and you're thinking about, oh no, the preacher's going to send me to Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, the preacher's going to send me to somebody they're going to want to debate and I don't know a thing. Oh no, preacher's going to send me to somebody I'm going to go in there and I'm going to catch coronavirus. First this. For somebody who's not gone so winning, it's the devil, boy, he'll scare you to death. 
It's a daring choice. The Bible says that in Hebrews 11 where we read, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing. Choosing. He did it by faith. Like the three Hebrew children's choice to not bow before the king's image. They believed that God was able to deliver them out of the hand of the king. But even if he did not do it, what did they say? We will not bow, king. Amen. They made a choice. It's a daring choice. Moses considered the action he was going to make. He counted the cost. And he just cast himself upon the Lord God of Israel rather than the gods of the Egyptians of the household that he was leaving. And the third thing I want to say about Moses' choice is Moses' choice was damaging. Moses' choice was damaging. What I mean by that is it cost him. Now, if you're like me, you've made some choices through the years that were wrong choices. They cost you as well. I would much rather suffer whatever price I'd have to pay for doing right than to suffer and pay a price for doing wrong. Because if you do right and you have to give up something, if you do right and it costs you something, I want you to know that God is able to reward you here. And for sure, He'll reward you up there. No, salvation is not a reward. Heaven is not a reward. But for saved people who suffer loss for Jesus now, great is your reward in heaven. God's got a reward for His people. For Moses, it cost him. He said, suffer. And refusing to be called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer. He suffered affliction. He suffered loss. It cost him power. It cost him prestige. It cost him possessions for then and, and for down the road, losing out on any kind of uh, future inheritance that he might have gotten. But that choice was a choice that he made. And that choice, let me say finally, that choice was what I'm going to call developmental. That is, it not only revealed his character, but it shaped his character to send him in a direction by which God would mold him into what God wanted him to be. God used the time that he was in Pharaoh's household, a period of 40 years, God used that to shape Moses. And he, based on what his mama had taught him, what God had worked in him, as well as his observation, observation of the Egyptians and their wisdom and their wickedness and their religion, Moses made the right choice. Amen. Making that right choice, he ended up out away from Egypt and he ended up in a strange land keeping sheep. And you know what? God turned Moses into the greatest shepherd of all time. God gave Moses the greatest flock of all time. I say the choice that he made was developmental. The Bible says in Isaiah 7, 16, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. What I'm saying by that verse is we grow in our ability to make wise choices. And our wise choices enable us to grow better than if we've made wrong choices. Sure. I want to encourage you on this last Sunday of June to don't let this service go by without choosing right. Amen. If you're lost, choose now to trust Christ as your Savior. Whosoever will, the Bible says, let him come. If you're saved, choose today to do what God would have you to do. It shows your character. It strengthens your character. And it will send you in a direction that if you make the right choice, then you will be growing, making progress as a Christian individual should. I would encourage you this day, 
to ask yourself, are you willing to make that choice? Whatever you choose, I can't, I, I can, all I can do is command, teach, and encourage. But what I can do for me is I can make the right choice. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you stand with me, please, for our